being the sternocleidomastoid. It's easy to feel the mastoid process here, behind and below the ear. While we're getting introduced to the temporal bone, we'll take a first look at some of its other important features, which we'll appreciate in later sections of these two tapes. We'll also meet some of the small openings through which important blood vessels, nerves and other structures enter and leave the cranium. There are many of these openings. Here, we'll just look at the openings on the outside of the temporal and occipital bones. This is the zygomatic arch, formed largely by the temporal bone and partly by the adjoining zygomatic bone. Here on the underside of the root of the zygomatic arch, this complex curved surface articulates with the condyle of the mandible to form the temporomandibular joint. This is the external auditory meatus leading to the middle ear. This long, sharp projection is the styloid process. Just at the base of the styloid is the little stylomastoid foramen for the facial nerve. Medial to the styloid process are two major openings for blood vessels. The carotid canal passing forwards for the internal carotid artery and the jugular foramen passing backwards for the internal jugular vein. Just above the occipital condyle is the hypoglossal canal for the hypoglossal nerve. Let's take a brief look at the occipital and temporal bones from the inside. Here's the squamous part of the occipital bone. Here's the basilar part. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the squamous part of the temporal bone. Here's the petrous part, which contains the structures of the inner and middle ear. Here's the jugular foramen on the inside. This big groove behind it is for the sigmoid sinus, the main venous drainage channel for the brain. Below and medial to the jugular foramen is the hypoglossal canal. Above the jugular foramen is the internal auditory meatus for the vestibulocochlear and facial nerves. The carotid canal ends here at the foramen lacerum, as we'll see in the next section. Now we've looked at the part of the skull that we're concerned with in this section. We'll move on now to look at the bones below it. First, we'll look at the special features of the first two cervical vertebrae, the atlas and the axis. Then we'll look at the continuity of the cervical spine with the bones of the upper part of the trunk. Here's the atlas. Here's the axis. These two vertebrae are adapted to allow movement of the head. Forward flexion and extension of the head take place up here at the atlanto-occipital joints. Lateral flexion of the head takes place at these joints too. Rotation of the head, together with the atlas, happens here at the joints between the atlas and the axis, the atlanto-axial joints. Because of their special functions, the atlas and the axis differ in several ways from typical cervical vertebrae. As we've seen in Volume 3, a typical cervical vertebra has a body in front and a neural arch behind, enclosing the vertebral foramen. It has a spinous process behind with two tuberosities and a transverse process on each side, also with two tuberosities. On each side, there are two articular surfaces, one above and one below, which form the intervertebral joints. The articular surfaces slope upward and forward. They're connected by this mass of bone, the articular pillar. Each vertebra is joined to its neighbors by an intervertebral disc in front and by two intervertebral joints behind, one on each side. 
Now let's look at ways in which the atlas and the axis are different. The atlas vertebra doesn't have a body. In front, it just has this narrow anterior arch, which matches the posterior arch. The two arches of the atlas, together with these two lateral masses, enclose an unusually large vertebral foramen. This part is occupied by the spinal cord, this part by the odontoid process of the axis, which we'll meet in a moment. The upper articular surfaces of the atlas are shaped like parts of the inside of a cup to match the shape of the occipital condyles. The lower articular surfaces of the atlas are shaped like parts of the inside of a cone. Now let's look at the axis vertebra. The body of the axis is prolonged by this important projection, the odontoid process. In terms of development, the odontoid process represents the missing body of the atlas. In terms of function, it's the pivot around which the head, together with the atlas, rotates. The upper articular surfaces of the axis are placed well in front of the lower ones. The upper surfaces are in a straight line with the odontoid process. As rotation occurs between these surfaces and those of the atlas, the odontoid process stays in the middle. The odontoid process is surrounded in front and on each side by bone. It's held in place behind by a strong ligament, the transverse ligament of the atlas. The odontoid process is also held in place from above by two strong ligaments, the alar ligaments, which are attached here and here. We'll see these ligaments shortly. The odontoid process has two small articular surfaces, one behind for the transverse ligament and one in front for the anterior arch of the atlas. To see how these structures relate to the base of the skull, we'll take an inside look from behind at a specimen in which the neural arches and the back of the occipital bone have been removed. Here's the foramen magnum. Here's the inside of the basal part of the occipital bone. Here's the atlas. Here's the axis. Here's the odontoid process. Here are the atlanto-occipital joints and the atlanto-axial joints. Now that we've seen the atlas and the axis, we'll look at the bones below them that are involved in support and movement of the head.